I'd like to thank uh, uh, Jim Dunbar and uh, Jana and Jillian and everyone else for inviting me. And uh, it's a fascinating uh, organization you have there <laughs> with fantastic uh, conferences. The first talk I gave, I won't tell you, in the 70s, uh, the first question I was asked in my career was about what the Pleistocene record of Canada signified for uh, early humans. And I think, I hope I say something that's relevant to the archeological and historical uh, uh, groups that uh, participate in Osella's uh, research institute. So let me get started because I have a lot to cover. And uh, we were asked to focus on our Chesapeake Bay work, which we did several years ago. And my talk is complemented by Deb Willard's, <coughs> which is coming up in a minute. Uh, well, there was my first slide, just to mention uh, what I just said, and a, a disclaimer required uh, by the geological survey nowadays with all the Zoom conferencing, uh, this is uh, appropriate language. But let's talk about Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I'm gonna first show you the land view, which uh, many people have seen. You can see the white line outlines the watershed, which is the focus of managing the bay and pollution oxygen depletion and other pro problems. Uh, you can see the bay is our largest estuary uh, labeled in yellow. And uh, this is a land view and I will let Deb Willard talk more about the land. And I'm gonna focus more on the water in the bay. And here's a different view of the bay, which shows you the currents uh, of the North Atlantic. And I wanna emphasize that the records I'm going to show that get a little detailed about the paleo uh, history of Chesapeake Bay uh, reflect changes in this cold southward flowing water that you see in green and your, your well-known Gulf Stream which is in uh, red. So keep those in mind as I show you the variability in both temperature and salinity in the bay. I won't have time to talk about this in detail uh, but since I'm going to talk a little about sea level uh, I wanted to point out that the entire Atlantic uh, coastal plain has a fantastic record of past sea level high stands, which are very relevant for uh, today and the future because they represent times of less ice uh, with fairly similar uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. So it's a rich record and uh, let's, let's look at the background that's been around for 15, 20 years, the famous hockey stick curve. It's been published in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports for several years. And what it does is shows, because I do paleo work, the last thousand years of paleo temperature on the bottom, and then the unprecedented in that time frame, uh, warming to the right up to the year 2000. What's shown above is volcanic variability, solar variability, and then at the bottom, greenhouse gas variability with the human signal here. And the take home message from this, which has been in the literature for years, is that you can't explain this on the bottom without this as a major factor. I'm gonna cover the last 2000 years of Chesapeake from work we did in 1999 and 2003 and, and prior years using the French vessel, the Marion Dufresne, which is a pretty big ship for uh, Chesapeake Bay, but it allowed us to take long sediment cores in various areas. You can see the core pipes here. And that, because of the high sedimentation rate in Chesapeake Bay, allows us to look at decadal scale changes over the last uh, several thousand years. Uh, you can't do this without good geophysics, so I have to give a shout out to uh, Peter Vogt of the Naval Research Lab, who did the geophysics in order to help at the top in order to help us site the core locations in the channel of the bay here, and you can see the map on the side shows them. So we have a lot of mud from Chesapeake Bay and a lot of uh, geophysical context for this work. If you look at an X radiograph done by the Maryland Geological Survey, you can see that there's fantastic uh, signals in the sediments reflecting oscillations in rainfall, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and dissolved oxygen. So it's a fantastically high resolution record of the history of the bay. I'm gonna spend a minute, so you don't think I'm inventing these things, uh, to, to talk about our proxies. This is the benthic forum preserved in the sediments. 
And we studied the oxygen isotope ratios of that. We studied the magnesium calcium ratios in this ostracot, a bivalve crustacea, for paleothermometry. So we're aiming to look in a, in a nutshell at the salinity and temperature variability in the bay. We use a calibration for the magnesium calcium shown here. It's a simple regression uh, based on modern uh, material and it simply shows the higher the temperature, the higher the magnesium calcium ratios in the calcitic shell of the ostracot. In a similar way, this gets a little complicated, but it shows you what you have to go to to understand the oxygen isotope ratio of this also calcium carbonate uh, organism, alphidium. And I'm gonna go through this fast. You don't have to memorize it, but it shows you how we calculate past rainfall. We look at the vital effect, which is a, a biological factor in the alphidium. The relationship between river discharge and salinity, and salinity is strong, as you might uh, expect from that map of the watershed I showed you. Uh, the, the bay calcite water <coughs> is, uh, we use this equation, the regional precipitation discharge of the rivers using USGS monitoring gauges is shown here. And then finally, the salinity is, is calculated here. What does this all get us? If we look at the modern water in the bay, the negative O18 values are down here in the fresh water, and this is the ocean water. So it's a very, very good proxy of past salinity, which is driven by river discharge, which is driven by rainfall. Logical. I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but there's uh, several take home messages. This is the last 2000 years of precipitation temperature salinity. Okay. And you can see here, multi-decadal variability based on the wiggles in these lines, especially during the medieval warm period about a thousand years ago, also called the medieval climate anomaly and the little ice age. Whoops. I don't know why that won't change. Hold on a second. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, as I mentioned, this shows you Chesapeake Bay, basically the last thousand years getting uh, less saline and therefore we have a wetter climate, which is what we call antiphase, the opposite of what's happening in the tropics. But you can see that they both move in unison, except in opposite directions. In other words, what rainfall variability we see during this critical period uh, reflects the region, the mid-Atlantic, and not the tropics. I can get uh, a much bigger picture by looking at other records of the last 2,000 years. Here we are in the Bay, all the way over to the Nordic Seas and the North Atlantic and the tropics. And what we see is not synchronous changes. So when we hear about the medieval climate anomaly <coughs> or the little ice age, things are not always as simple, but we do have the regional uh, data in case anybody's interested in the last 2000 years. The second part of my talk, <coughs> how fast can sea level rise? I think we all care about that question, certainly in Florida, Texas, and, uh, and the mid-Atlantic. Uh, what contributes to sea level rise? What are our geological records of sea level, especially along the East Coast? And what is the regional sea level variability? And AMOC is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Going back to that a slide of the North Atlantic and the green cold current and the red warm current, because that's what's driving uh, this uh, regional variability. Uh, we should all know this, 21st century rates of sea level rise may uh, exceed 10 millimeters per year with three times the rate since 1993, multiple causes. Rates in the Chesapeake area may be higher. Models don't provide reg yet uh, regional sea level patterns for the future. There are different kinds of models, empirical models, but the take on question is what's the future ice mass balance, not just the warming of the ocean and the atmosphere, but, and, and by the way, the last uh, 15, 20 years, actually, I've been working in the Arctic Ocean uh, and I'll show you where in a second, but I, that's for another day. 
I want to show you the importance of comparing uh, actual measurements of sea level rise to the models. And I deliberately go back to the third Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projected this gray area for the future sea level. Okay, now that's a while ago, but the same thing is happening now. We now have the satellite record of global sea level in blue, and you can see it's way at the top of the past projections. In other words, we underestimated the rate of sea level rise. This is also true today. If you look into the future, a number of methods have been used to project, there's the year 2100, here we are today. And I uh, made this slide a couple of years ago, and you can see about 80 centimeters of global sea level rise is in the middle of the range. Here's the 22, where the 22 estimate is for 2050, the year 2050 in here. And you can see that uh, that figure, that number of about a foot has been updated in the last few months. So this is very current, a foot of sea level rise. So it's constantly evolving how much we know about sea level. As I mentioned, uh, the rich sea level record of the Atlantic coastal plain for marine isotope stages, which are interglacials like our current Holocene interglacial is fantastic. And uh, beyond the, my, my time limit here, but uh, we've worked on that. And it's fantastic because the fossil record of the coastal plain, this is near Norfolk, Virginia, which shows you these marine mercenary shells and circulate worm tubes. In other words, here is a marine deposit above current sea level, meaning there was less ice in the, two, in the, uh, in the ice sheets, even though the CO2 concentration was the same so as, as, as pre-industrial and Holocene. So that's of concern because we don't totally understand why these past sea level high stands uh, occurred. In Chesapeake, this really could be uh, described as the birth of Chesapeake Bay, 6,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And our quarry with the French ship recovered all of these uh, sediments, radiocarbon dated, and there's your sea level curve uh, for the last, uh, for 10,000 to 6,000. And you can see, this is about when the bay was flooded, right in here, okay? It used to be, of course, during the last glacial, the last ice age, a, a extension of the Susquehanna River. I think Deb has a slide to show that. Uh, but here's your origin of Chesapeake Bay for the last deglacial period. And my uh, colleague uh, and former student, Robert Poirier, made this really sli uh, nice slide. It's a, it takes uh, tw 20 seconds. If you uh, look, the yellow bar on the bottom is at 11,000 years ago. So this is a cartoon showing you that same rise in sea level here up to four or 5,000 years ago for the bay. And it's gonna show you uh, that from a map view, from the time view. And then if you look over here, what he did is really neat, uh, is he showed the ice. So you're gonna see in each time step, the ice melting. So this is the end of the last ice age when the bay was flooded. And incidentally, I'll mention this is Greenland, of course, and Canada, and here's the bay down here. But what you'll see is that what we, in 2019, we were on the icebreaker Odin, uh, a Swedish ship working with a, a large international group, which in fact included archeologists looking at the archeological record of, uh, of Greenland. And you'll see that this was ice and what we're studying is the history of this ice uh, now. But let me just see if I can get this cartoon to go. So you can watch whatever you want, but watch the ice melt. Right about now, when that ice, that was enough ice to melt to flood the bay, as you can see on the left. And sea levels varied in the last 4,000 years, but not nearly as much. Cool, huh? I'd show it again, but I think, hold on. Well, I'm doing all right. Let's watch it again. I'll take a question. I love cartoons. Hold, hold on. 
So you see here, the bay is land, and see the uh, up on the upper left, the flooding of the bay based on the bathymetry. And, and of course, this, is, this Greenland ice sheet is what we have remaining. It used to be much larger, connected to the northern Canadian Laurentide and Inuitian ice, ice sheet. Uh, but now we have that. And by the way, going back to that projection of future sea level, Greenland and parts of Antarctica are the major contributors to the future sea level, future sea level. So it's really critical to understand how this and the Antarctic ice sheet behave. <laughs> so let's just summarize here. Uh, Sea level rates can in the past exceed uh, three times the current rate. The multiple causes of regional sea level rise rates, what I did not stress, but I think some of you <laughs> know this, it, just the news the last six months, is that the rate of modern sea level rise in Chesapeake Bay exceeds the global rate because the land is sinking. And the reason the land is sinking is because it, it was popped up when we had all that ice in the north, down to northern New Jersey, but not the mid-Atlantic. And it's now subsiding now that that load of ice is melted. In other words, we call that glacial isostatic adjustment. So your rates of sea level rise in Chesapeake are faster than the global rates due to <clears throat> isostatic adjustment. You have different reasons why the rates are higher than global in, for example, uh, Louisiana or Texas. So regional rates are critical. Uh, the rates in the mid-Atlantic are, I just mentioned that, uh, due to higher factors, and that there are multi-decadal patterns of climate and sea level, which we need to understand. So I want to thank everybody again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'll be here all today, and uh, and my email uh, is in the, re in the, the program. Thank you very much.